guys, I'm the Comics Kid 2099, and I have got a graphic novel that I would like to talk to you a little bit about. X-Men, The Wedding of Cyclops and Phoenix. This is a massive book. It took me a little while to read it. I started reading it well over a week ago, and I would read like an issue a day. So since there's like 20 issues collected here or something like that, it took me a little while to read it. Let me go ahead and tell you what all issues are collected in here. It's going to take me a little while because there's a lot. X-Men issues 27 through 30 and Annual 2, X-Men Unlimited issue 3, Uncanny X-Men 308 through 310 and Annual 18, X-Men The Wedding Album, and What If issue 60. Uh, so there's quite a few issues in there, and this is going to be a fairly short video because I don't really have a whole lot to say here. Uh, this is about 400 pages of comic, and nothing happens in this entire book. The only noteworthy thing to happen in this entire 400 page tome is that Cyclops and Phoenix get married. That's the only thing. Uh, and it is shocking to me how very little actually happened in this entire span of issues. And basically, and, and you may think I'm joking, I'm really not joking. It is surprising how very little happens, like issue upon issue, where it's like, okay, this was just another one where characters kind of talked for a little bit. And you would think that this type of issue, that those kinds of issues would just be right up my alley because I'm the kind of person, I'm much more about character than I am action and plot and stuff like that. Plot is very important to me, but it's not the most important thing. And you would think a book that has so very little going on in the way of story would have to have some character stuff going on. But since there's like 300 X-Men at this point in the Marvel Universe, it doesn't really spend a lot of time with any one X-Men. You might have one issue that kind of focuses on Jubilee, and then another issue that kind of focuses on Archangel, and then an issue that kind of focuses on Psylocke. And each issue does an okay job focusing on those X-Men, but frankly, it just feels really kind of phoned in at times. Uh, it really feels really melodramatic in a lot of places where, of course, this is the early 1990s, and I've never made a secret that the 1990s is my least favorite decade for comic books, and doubly so for the X-Men, where I really feel like all the people who followed Chris Claremont just had a lot of trouble following in his footsteps, really trying to get a hold of the characters. I think it took a really long time for the creators to really grasp the X-Men and get a good handle on them. And this was kind of a rough patch where a creator would be on an X-Men title and then they would leave after maybe two years of being on it and leaving more questions than answers, leaving a lot of drop subplots that they didn't have any intention of uh, bringing back up because they were leaving to go do something else. Uh, a lot of stuff like that going on. So anyway, uh, I need to get back to what actually happens in this book, which is not a whole heck of a lot, like I said. Uh, you've got a lot of uh, characters whining about the legacy virus going on. You've got a lot of characters whining about Sabretooth living at the mansion, and that subplot actually gets its start here. We actually see the issue where Sabretooth comes to live at the mansion. But nothing is ever done with that subplot. Uh, here we see a lot of characters have a problem with it, and rightly so, because Sabretooth is not like Wolverine. He's not just a roughhouser. He is a psychopath who has murdered a lot of people. And unlike Wolverine, who has killed a lot of people, Sabretooth enjoys it, and he knows what he's doing. Wolverine is usually, like, there have been times where he's killed people, but he's not in control of his actions when he does that. And when he does kill people, like out in the field, it's not like he's, you know, licking the blood off his claws and saying, oh boy, that was fun. Sabretooth is that kind of character. And so, a lot of the X-Men are just, like, furious that Sabretooth is living at the mansion. The problem is, that subplot is kind of dead in the water upon arrival, because... Sabretooth is one of those villains, it really doesn't make any sense at all to try and reform him. You've got characters like Rogue and Emma Frost and even Magneto, those characters are villains, or at least they were when they were first introduced, but then over time, it made more sense to have them join the X-Men. Uh, Emma Frost, it's been over 10 years, it's been over 20 years since she was a full-blown villain, and Rogue, it's been closer to 30 years since she was a villain. Those characters started off as villains, but in the way that their reformation was handled, it made a lot of sense. Sabretooth is a character, there's no way that you can have him reform and become a good guy and it makes sense. And the writers eventually realized that because around the time of the Phalanx Covenant, you had Sabretooth helping Emma Frost and Banshee get away from the Phalanx and then eventually he escapes. And Nothing is ever done with this story of Sabretooth living at the mansion, other than he lived at the mansion for a little while. And I get the feeling that the writers wanted to do something different. They wanted to kind of shake things up a little bit 
but the way that they tried to do it was just kind of stupid because Sabretooth is a character who, he's just bad to his core, and there's really no way that you can work him as a good guy. Now, later on, much later on, in the late 90s in X-Factor, and then in the mid-2000s in Adjectiveless X-Men by Mike Carey, those different uh, stories played Sabretooth working with the good guys, but he had, I think in uh, X-Factor, he had like a collar on that prevented him from doing anything violent at all. And then in Adjectiveless X-Men, he had Nano Sentinels in his body, so the X-Men were basically forcing him to work with them. And in those cases, it made a lot more sense because he clearly did not want to be there. Here, he wants to be here, and it just doesn't work. And like I said, you've also got some characters whining about the legacy virus. Now, the legacy virus is a story that I think works better on paper than it does in execution. Because on paper, you've got the X-Men, they are a metaphor for racism and just intolerance in general. And so, the legacy virus is basically taking that to the next level. Around this time, AIDS was kind of becoming an even bigger deal than it was. It kind of got its start in the 80s, and this is the early 90s, so the legacy virus is basically a metaphor for that. And in paper, like I said, on paper it sounds great. You're taking the real world and you're turning it on its head a little bit and applying it to the X-Men in a fictional way. The problem with the legacy virus is that A, it went on way too long. It started in, I believe it was the Executioner's song is when Strife uh, released the legacy virus into the world, and it wasn't until the death of Colossus was like 2000. So that was like six to eight years. That was longer than six years. It was closer to eight years that the legacy virus was an ongoing threat for the X-Men. And unfortunately, if you're not going to cure the legacy virus until the year 2000, then all you can really do is have characters wax poetic about how it's really tragic that this disease is killing all of these mutants. And that's all they do. And this book is just... Nothing happens in this book. That's all I can really say about it. If you like wedding issues in comic books, then you may want to pick this up. But really, I cannot recommend this book. It's just not that good. Very, very little actually happens here. And when I said earlier about if you like wedding issues, I personally don't. Usually, they're very schmaltzy. They're really overly melodramatic. It's like, oh, I can't believe it. This is the most beautiful day I've ever seen in my entire life. And it's like, oh, come on, shut up. There is no way that anyone thinks that this is actually good and well written. And this wasn't really good and well written. You've got all these characters acting like this is the happiest day of my life. And it feels really false in several places because around this time, the X-Men did not really get along with X-Force, and then you've got all these members of X-Force at the wedding acting like nothing is going on at all, and maybe that's, it's really, it doesn't make any sense, because in this very book, you've got Banshee ready to punch Cable because of Cable, air quotes, corrupting Banshee's daughter, Siren, but then they're both at the wedding as if nothing is going on at all, and this, I just, I can't say enough bad things about this book. I read this entire thing, I kept expecting something to happen. And while I was reading it, it occurred to me, whoever was working on this, all of the creators working on this, somebody somewhere forgot that there is a crucial difference between subplot and plot. Subplot is when you've got a character who is worrying about how are they going to tell their boss that they are going to quit and move to another job or something like that. And you've got that going on for like three issues. Plot is, in a particular issue, you've got a character fighting a supervillain or something like that. That is the difference between plot and subplot. And what is really fundamentally wrong with this book right here is that there is almost no plot at all, and it is all subplot. Each issue is just something that should be a subplot thing, but it is turned into a plot thing that takes up most of the issue, or all of it, frankly. And that's just kind of not good. You've got an entire issue where Professor Xavier realizes that he needs to be more okay with Cyclops and Jean getting married. And then you've got an entire issue where Archangel and Psylocke go to the Hellfire Club. These things should have taken place over several issues and be like three pages per issue, and then you need to actually have something going on in each issue, instead of nothing going on for like 18 issues. And that's basically my big complaint about this book. It's really not very good at all. Uh, I would say, and, and like I said, I'm not a fan of X-Men comics from the 90s in general, but if I compare this to Avengers X-Men Blood Ties or X-Men A Skinning of Souls, both of those books are better than this. That's kind of what we're dealing with here. This is an all-time low in the 90s, even. And I'm sure I could find something in the 90s that's worse than this, but this 
I, I expected it to be better, and it's really not very good at all. So like I said, if you like wedding issues done in comic books, then maybe pick this up. Or, frankly, I think you could just go and find the wedding issue in the single issues in your comic book shop and don't fork out whatever this is, $35, for this comic book. I, I fortunately had a coupon when I bought this, so it wasn't quite $35, but still, I think I overpaid for it. So, uh, don't buy this book. I highly recommend that you skip this book. This is a, definitely a must-skip. And uh, that's all I have to talk about today. I hope that you guys enjoyed this review. I hope that it was helpful for you, and if it was... I hope that you guys will check out some videos that I'll be doing later on in the future whenever I get around to doing them. And in the meantime, I will see you guys later. Have a great day.